Happy Halloween, everyone. Do you enjoy Halloween theme movies? I'm not much of a moviegoer, but I do have my favorites. And since I'm of the more, shall we say, mature persuasion, some of these movies are not real recent, but some are classics. So here it is, my top 10 favorite Halloween theme movies. Let me know what yours are in the comments. Three Columbia University professors experience an encounter with a ghost at the New York Public Library. After being canned by the dean, they open their own paranormal business called Ghostbusters. Called to the Sedgwick Hotel and dressed like exterminators, they run into a ghost that's scarfing down all the hotel food. After capturing this gluttonous pig, supernatural activity increases and the Ghostbusters become rock stars. The party didn't last for long because the EPA shows up and wants to know where all the ghosts are being kept. The EPA guy returns with law enforcement, who proceed to shut the equipment off, causing an explosion, releasing all the ghosts. The Ghostbusters end up in jail, but when faced with a supernatural apocalypse, the mayor releases the Ghostbusters to clean up the mess caused by the EPA. This seems more than a little ironic. So if you want to watch a fun ghost movie, this one is for you. You don't have to think too much, just sit back and be entertained. Reagan, the young daughter of actress Chris McNeil, starts to act strangely, or at least more strangely than most 12-year-olds, after going through what seems to be hundreds of doctors who believe Reagan is mentally ill, apparently these MDs didn't notice Reagan's demon eyes, Chris finally enlists the help of two priests to perform an exorcism. At the end, one of them sacrifices himself by absorbing the demon from Reagan and jumps out of a window, taking the demon with him. This movie has a little bit of a different take than most ghost movies. The dead are trying to get rid of the living instead of the other way around. Adam and Barbara Maitland die in an automobile accident when their Volvo crashes into a river. They end up back at their house and not only figure out they're dead, but must also deal with a couple who bought and redecorated their house. Their daughter Lydia seems to be the only one who can see them. Adam and Barbara try to enlist the help of the undead office and find that the head matron just doesn't have time for them. She warns them to stay away from Beetlejuice, a man who killed himself in the 1800s and lives in the Maitland's model house. Adam and Barbara try to handle the situation themselves, but end up being the victims of so-called paranormal expert and resident jerk, Otho. Lydia comes to the rescue by calling on Beetlejuice and promising to marry him. Once Adam and Barbara are rescued, they get rid of Beetlejuice and in the process get their house back along with the original decor with Lydia and her parents living with them. Actress Madeline Ashton and writer Helen Sharp are frenemies who compete for the affections of plastic surgeon Ernest Menville. Helen is engaged to Ernest, but he breaks off the engagement and marries Madeline. Helen goes through an emotional breakdown and porks up and spends time in a psychiatric hospital where she plots revenge on Madeline. Time passes and Ernest is now an alcoholic while Madeline spends her time hand-wringing over her fading career and counting every wrinkle on her face. Out of the blue, they're invited to a party to celebrate Helen's new book and find that Helen is now thin and young. 
Madeline goes to her spa, and the spa owner gives her the card of a wealthy woman who specializes in rejuvenation. Madeline drinks a potion that makes her young again. Unfortunately, she is also now dead. Turns out, Helen drank the same potion a few years before, and that's why she looks so young. So both are dead, and that leaves Ernest, the plastic surgeon, to deal with the upkeep of both women's bodies. Ernest decided to bail on both of these self-absorbed undead women and runs off. Thirty-seven years later, they show up at his funeral, both worse for wear. They find that Ernest cleaned up, remarried, and had kids. Although mortal, he had a great life, while Helen and Madeline became broken, lonely, peeling mannequins. Jack Skellington, the Pumpkin King of Halloween Town, is bored with doing the same old thing every year for Halloween, finding Halloween Town too dark and wanting to cheer things up a little bit. He wanders off in the woods with his dog Zero, looking for answers. They trudge along under the pumpkin sun and fall through a door in a Christmas tree and find Christmas Town. He sees snow everywhere and gazes at it in awe, like a South Texan would. Curiosity, not fear. Jack returns to Halloween Town and tries to get the residents to help him put on Christmas instead of Halloween. It becomes obvious, in short order, that these Halloween Town residents are more than a little clueless when they mistake the Easter Bunny for Santa Claus. Sally, the only one in Halloween Town with any sense, tries to talk Jack out of this idea. Santa Claus is kidnapped by some of the residents of Halloween Town and imprisoned. Jack subs for the real Santa and delivers a lot of weird, terrifying presents to the kids. Shrunken heads, bats, etc. The military shoots down Jack. Jack, now being sorry about the trouble he's caused, rescues Santa and Sally. Santa causes it to snow in Halloween Town and Jack comes to his senses and smooches Sally. Louie, a vampire, gives an interview to reporter Daniel Malloy. At first, Malloy thinks this is some kind of a gag. Then, he realizes it really isn't. Louie tells Malloy that after the death of his wife and child, he becomes an alcoholic. He's attacked by a vampire named Lestat. Lestat, unlike most vampires, gives Louis a choice. To be a vampire or not to be a vampire, and just die. Making the wrong move, like many of us do, he decides to give vampire life a go. Soon, Louis has second thoughts and finds killing immoral, unlike Lestat, who seems to be good with it. Louis survives by feasting on small animals, which Lestat finds incredibly funny. Lestat lives with Louis at his Louisiana plantation, and the slaves begin to be creeped out by him. I was creeped out by him, too. Louis tells his slaves to burn the mansion down, since Louis believes he's the devil. Now homeless, Louis wanders the plague-infested streets. He runs into a 12-year-old girl whose mother has just died. Not being able to control himself anymore and sick of rat blood, Louis feeds from the girl. Upon discovering this, Lestat is thrilled that Louis has finally come over to the dark side. Lestat turns the girl into a vampire so she won't die and names her Claudia. Later on, Claudia realizes that she is stuck as a little girl and is less than pleased. Then the chickens come home to roost, as they usually do when you keep secrets, and she wants to know what's going on. She wants revenge. Claudia tricks Lestat into drinking dead blood from two boys she poisoned with laudanum. Then Claudia slits his throat. She and Louis dump the body in a lake full of alligators. Unfortunately, the alligators keep Lestat alive, and he comes back looking more like Freddy Krueger than Tom Cruise. Louis sets him on fire and their house burns down. 
Louis and Claudia leave to search for other vampires and run into a vampire named Armando in Paris. Armando invites Louis and Claudia to live with him at his coven. The rest of the Parisian vampires think this is a terrible idea and throw Claudia in a dungeon and lock Louis in a coffin. At dawn, Claudia is burned to death by the sun and Louis is freed by Armando. Louis sets the coven on fire, killing most of the vampires. Louis returns to New Orleans and discovers Lestat living alone and in terrible condition. Louis leaves Lestat. Fast forward to the interview. Daniel now wants Louis to turn him into a vampire. Louis, being less than thrilled, attacks Daniel and disappears. Daniel, driving down the road in his Mustang, is shocked when Lestat appears in the car. Lestat drinks just enough blood to be strong enough to drive and gives Daniel the same choice he gave Louis all those years ago. Die or complete the vampire transition. This movie is just fun. It also has Jack Nicholson in it, which makes it even more fun. His character describes himself as that horny little devil. The witches, played by Susan Sarandon, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Cher, don't know they're witches. All three of them are missing their men. One is a widow, one is divorced, and one has been deserted. They're sitting around talking about what the ideal man would be like. Enter Jack Nicholson, a.k.a. Daryl, who buys the town's mega mansion. Daryl worms himself into the lives of these three women, and gradually they discover the powers they have. After a time, they become fearful of their powers and eventually use witchcraft to get rid of Daryl, setting up the funniest scene in the movie, in my opinion. They use a Daryl voodoo doll to stick pins in. The contortions Daryl goes through are priceless. He eventually winds up in a church performing an epic rant in true Nicholson style. The women and Daryl eventually patch things up, sort of, and wind up living in Daryl's mansion. This is an example of bullied teenage girl getting even on steroids. A girl named Carrie has no friends and is stuck with a crazy mother who fills her head with all sorts of weird ideas. Carrie also discovers that she has powers of telekinesis, so her mother calls her a witch. Mom is not a candidate for Mother of the Year. Sick of her mother, Carrie decides to go to the prom since she's been invited by a hot guy. At the prom, Carrie's classmates fix the voting to make sure that Carrie is crowned prom queen. This is a setup as the bullies set up a bucket with pig's blood to fall on Carrie when she's crowned. After that, Carrie proceeds to seal everyone in the building and torch the school. Making her way home, she bathes and caps off the night by killing her mother with flying knives, then burns down the house and dies. The only survivor, Sue, has a recurring dream where she visits the house to put flowers on her grave. Carrie's hand pops up from underground and grabs her. Carrie was based on Stephen King's first published novel. Here's Johnny. Writer and recovering alcoholic Jack Torrance is dealing with writer's block and takes a job as an off-season caretaker at a hotel in an effort to get some inspiration. Before he takes the job, he's warned by the hotel manager, a Pat Sajak look-alike, that the previous caretaker went stir-crazy and killed his wife and daughters. Despite this, he takes his wife and young son along anyway. We'll soon find out that Jack, like Carrie's mom, isn't exactly Parent of the Year material. The hotel, The Overlook, has an evil aura about it, and it ends up driving an already mentally shaky Torrance insane. Nicholson's facial expressions are truly terrifying and show why he's one of the best actors around. Based on a Stephen King novel, 
This movie has an interesting twist at the end, to put it mildly. Of course, it's based on a Stephen King novel. So, of course it would. I'm guessing that many of you weren't even a glint in your parents' eyes when this classic was released. Guy Woodhouse, an actor, and his wife Rosemary move into an apartment building, the Bramford, in New York City, despite warnings from their best friend and the fact that the previous tenant is acting more than a little weird. Just like in The Shining, they ignore warnings and move in anyway, because, well, why not? Guy ends up befriending the weird neighbors, Minnie and Roman Castavet. Rosemary doesn't warm up to them like her husband does, but unknown to her, her husband is getting all sorts of benefits from his new buddies, who are Satanists. He gets a part in a play after the lead actor goes blind. In exchange, Guy stands by while Minnie Castavet drugs his wife and is impregnated by the devil. What a prince! In the end, Rosemary ends up taking care of the baby. As in The Shining, the movie is based on a novel written by Ira Levin about witches and demons. The Dakota, which became famous where John Lennon was murdered, was used for exterior shots of the Bramford. Frank Sinatra was less than thrilled with his wife Mia Farrow taking this project, and his lawyer served her with divorce papers in front of the movie crew. Today, Rosemary's Baby is considered a classic with Ruth Gordon winning an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress and Mia Farrow winning a David D. Donatello Award for Best Foreign Actress.